You're now in the place to be with the CBDC Asset Group. Thank you for being a part of the group. You guys wanted me to share videos of news and interesting information. Here you go. This is the UBRI Connect 2021. Stu Alderati, the General Counsel for Ripple, and Adam Sterling from UC Berkeley Law. They talk about crypto, Ripple, and regulations. Hope you guys like it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. All right, everyone, and a uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Adam Sterling. I'm the executive director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Business. Today, I'm joined by Stu Alderodi, who is the general counsel of Ripple. He's responsible for legal, compliance, regulatory efforts at the company. Stu, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for doing it. Now, I'm going to be moderating a conversation. We have about 45 minutes. If you have questions, send them through the q and I'll do my best to monitor those questions during the conversation. If I can incorporate them into the conversation, I will. We'll try to save 10 or so minutes at the end to address any questions we didn't cover. So again, I'll be monitoring the Q&A. We won't get to them to the end, but if I can find a way to incorporate them, I will. So Stu, uh, pleasure to be here and, and you know, Let's start off. You've had a really interesting career. You've been a litigator. You've worked at major law firms. You've been an executive at some of the world's largest financial institutions. You joined Ripple in 2019. And I think folks like you leaving the financial, the traditional financial sector and moving into blockchain is a validation of the industry in and of itself. And I'm curious if you can talk a bit about your career and what brought you to Ripple. Great. Well, thanks, Adam. Um, so I've been doing this for uh, more than 30 years, actually probably more than 35 years, if I'm going to be honest with myself. First, and I managed my entire career in New York City prior to taking my job at Ripple. Uh, first half of my career was traditional law firm, uh, big law firm, New York City, start as an associate, work your way up, you know, through the ranks. Eventually, you know, you become a partner there. Uh, focusing, uh, really I was a litigator and I was a trial lawyer, although uh, in my stint in private practice I had two assignments as a special assistant uh, U.S. attorney. And then the second half of my career I went in-house, first with American Express where I was managing counsel, then I became um, general counsel for HSBC North America, and just prior to joining Ripple, I was general counsel for CIT Group, not City CIT Group, which was about a $50 billion bank holding company. Uh, and then one day I was sitting at my office in Manhattan overlooking Bryant Park. The phone rang and it was a, um, uh, a headhunter or a placement firm and said, we have a really neat opportunity for this company, Ripple out in San Francisco, would you be interested? And after spending so many years in traditional finance, after a while, it does become a little soul crushing. So I did some research uh, into Ripple. I liked what I saw. I had some meetings and then I really liked what I saw. I believe in the mission of Ripple. I believe in the leadership of Ripple, both at the management level and at the board level. And then perhaps just as importantly, or maybe most importantly, as a lawyer, to come into this space two and a half years ago, recognizing that there would be an opportunity to help create a regulatory framework for crypto and blockchain, both in the United States and globally. It just was an opportunity I felt I just could not pass up. And if I did pass it up, I would have regretted it for the rest of my professional career. And I'm thrilled that I did it when I did it. Now, investors invest with their pocketbook. And, and I think folks, lawyers, like you often invest with your, your time and, and your skills. And, and so to, to shift from you know, traditional finance into blockchain, uh, you were making an investment. And so what of the, as someone that spent their career in traditional finance, what excited you, if you can elaborate a bit on that? Well, I, I think a few things. Number one, um, in traditional finance, and I don't mean to, to bash it, um, people make a good living in traditional finance, but you don't feel like you're building anything on any given day. You don't feel like you're creating anything on any given day. I mean, you can spend 12, 13, 14 hours sometimes, you know, uh, you know, working away and you go home and you're like, boy, that was a really busy day, but what did I do? And you really can't define it. So number one, getting into the new space, which uh, it felt entrepreneurial, 
and it felt like we were building something new. We were, and Ripple was building and is building what's called the Internet of Value. Can value move like it? We move information today. Um, and can we do that through a blockchain-like solution? And we can do that through a digital asset solution. That that's what really attracted me to it. I be, again, I believed in that mission. I believe that there was a really good marriage between the technology and a real-world commercial application that had, um, a, you know, a good purpose, uh, purpose for good. Uh, and I think combining those two things with all of the other things I've talked about, the 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 maturity of the leadership of the board and management, and again, the legal challenge of doing that really attracted me. Well, it's been great to see as someone who kind of first came into the space about five years ago, just from an academic perspective, um, just to see attorneys like yourself, you know, Dan Gallagher over at Robinhood, who was an SEC commissioner. I think it really, again, speaks to, to the maturity of, of the space to to have folks like you operating in it. So just so we can set the stage, kind of dive into some of these regulatory challenges. And, and I appreciate you doing this. And, and I know, and I will say, uh, uh, given that you all are facing ongoing litigation, there are certain things you won't be able to dive into and we'll, we'll let you determine what you can or, or can't speak to. Um, but if you could help us set the stage. So, so given that, that Ripple is a U.S. company with operations in this country, you're, you're subject to, to U.S. laws. And maybe if someone who, who doesn't have a lot of experience in the legal space was kind of asking you, can you describe the regulatory landscape? Is it as simple as Congress makes the rules, the regulators like the SEC maybe help refine them and enforce them? Talk a bit about kind of the, the regulatory landscape of, of Ripple. Sure. So uh, we're a global company that happens to be based in San Francisco, and we have operations both in the United States, or not both, we have operations in the United States. We have a substantial presence in Singapore, in the UK, in the EU. Uh, we have a very substantial joint venture in Japan. We have a presence in Dubai. So we operate in, in a multitude of countries throughout the world. In all of those other countries where we operate, there's a clear regulatory framework, mostly through um, either a regulatory regime or a licensing regime. So if we want to do business in Singapore, we know we need a payment services license through the MAS and we apply for that license and we go through the process of getting that license. And once licensed, we know what the permissions are that we have through that license and, we'll, we'll, and the oversight that will be provided by the regulator. And there is some flavor of that in all of the other countries in which we operate. The U.S. is unique, and unique in an unfortunate way, I think, when it comes to this space in terms of the regulatory landscape, in terms of the laws, rules, and regulations, and how they apply to crypto have not been um, clearly articulated. The SEC, I think because of what we saw with ICOs, initial coin offerings, in the 2017 timeframe, kind of lurched into this space to stop what they saw to be fraud associated with capital raising. Yep. Uh, there's nothing controversial about that. If I'm going to lie to you when I take your money, I'll be held accountable. And usually that lands with the SEC, although they don't have exclusive jurisdiction over fraud. But as we expand beyond that, the question is, which regulatory agencies ultimately, and it could be a multitude of them, which regulatory agencies will have regulatory authority over the crypto space in the US? And that's a bit of an unsettled um, uh, point. The Department of Justice about two years ago issued a report and they identified eight regulatory agencies that touch crypto in, um, uh, in the US. Um, really quickly, sort of regulatory agencies. Yeah, please, no one. Uh, regulatory agencies, whether it's the SEC or the CFTC or some other agency, regulatory agencies are created by Congress. So they act independently, but they can't act outside of their legislative remit. They're supposed to create policy through rulemaking, which means you publish a proposed rule, you solicit comments from market participants, you, uh, you have feedback, there's a back and forth, and you land on a policy uh, reflected in a rule, and then you can enforce that rule. Congress acts as a check on that regulatory process through, if Congress is unhappy with the manner in which a regulatory agency is behaving, 
Congress can call hearings, they can withhold funding, they can pass new laws. And I think that is where we are at in this country. There, there is this to and froing that is getting louder every day between the SEC and Congress in terms of how are we going to regulate this space? Does it all roads lead to the SEC or do some roads lead to the CFTC or other agencies? And how are we going to sort that out? And it has not been sorted out in this country. Yeah. And so, so thanks, Stu. Really helpful. So I, is it fair to say Congress sets and, and kind of uh, uh, enforces the boundaries and then within that, the regulatory agencies make and then enforce the rules. And then within the crypto space, there's some ambiguity, uncertainty about certainly the, the rules, Congress's view on what the boundaries should be, what regulatory body is responsible. And, and so that's kind of the, the space that, that we're operating in. I think, yeah, I think you're actually, that, that's right now. So, Stu, I, I, I question for you, and, and we, we talked about this a bit yesterday, and, and it was really in, insightful, but, you know, given, maybe we, we kind of go back a, a, a few years, you know, given that this is the landscape in the United States, there's just ambiguity, and I, I think this is common with most new technologies, right? The technology moves quicker than the rulemaking, then the regulatory bodies, then Congress. So given this ambiguity, wasn't this kind of outcome of, of the regulatory bodies kind of wait and seeing, and then kind of picking large, high profile enforcement targets? I mean, wasn't that predictable? Um, no, I, I would say no, I, I would say no. I think early on, when we're talking, again, go just going back into the world of initial coin offerings, um, there's no dispute, and there's perfect clarity, and there's been perfect clarity since the beginning, beginning of time, yep. that if I'm going to take somebody's money and I'm going to defraud them out of the money, they're going to be hold, they're going to be held accountable. So I think that's what the SEC did at the beginning, because these were, many of these ICOs were uh, masking as capital raises, but they were really uh, classic fraud, right, uh, securities fraud. But the, once you go beyond the sort of classic fraud, even though you know we've got a case law from the Supreme Court that brings us back to 1946, here's what the law requires, right? Due process in this country requires that the law give a person of ordinary intelligence a reasonable opportunity to know what is prohibited. And as the SEC has sort of climbed up the ladder and went from classic securities fraud enforcement to much more esoteric theories, I think they, they have failed to give persons of ordinary intelligence in this space the opportunity to know what is prohibited. That's a really complicated and lawyer-like way of saying there is no clarity. Yeah, There's no clarity. It goes beyond fraud, right? So, so just a, a quick, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this as much as possible in layman's terms, but the, the Securities Act of 1933 and then the, the 34 Act, which creates the SEC and the securities rules, certainly it's intended to go after fraud, but it's also intended to require individuals, organizations to provide more disclosures for investors to make decisions and, and so the, the rule states, right, if I want to sell or even offer to sell a security, I, I either need to file a registration statement or have an exemption. So even, so let's get out of the crypto space. If I'm raising money for my startup and selling equity, I can't go sell that to my cousin unless my cousin is an accredited investor because there's an exemption for it. Even if it's not a fraud, it could be the next Facebook, right? So I guess, right, it, it does go beyond fraud. And, and so there are these, that rule I think is clear. And then, right, just so we know where we're at in the crypto space, the question then is, is are these assets, these, these goods, are they securities? And so, right, that goes beyond the question of whether they're fraudulent or not. That's right. And to be clear, the SEC's case against Ripple does not allege any fraud. It doesn't allege any right. market manipulation. It doesn't allege any fraud running, front running. It's a very technical question as to whether Ripple's distribution of the digital asset known as XRP, which began in 2013, uh, constituted in the distribution of an unregistered security. 
And that's that. That's the piece where I think the SEC, and I'll, I'll, I can get into this part of the case because it's, it's very public in terms of what our defense is. That's the part of the case, number one, we don't believe XRP is what's called an investment contract and therefore a security. But if the SEC are, is able to stretch the law that far, um, there was no fair notice to a market participant that the law would be stretched that far. And Again, we've got the Howey case, the Orange Grove case from 1946, and that's what everything tethers back to uh, as to what defines an investment contract and what doesn't define a, an investment contract. And the SEC is fond of saying, it's very clear, Gary Gensler gives a speech, it seems like every day or every other day, it's really clear, go read Howey. But I, I would ask if Howey is so clear, why then did the SEC have to issue a digital asset framework in 2019 that morphed three Howey factors into more than 30 Howey factors, depending on your account. Uh, Hester Peirce, the SEC commissioner, said that was the Jackson Pollock approach, where you just throw a lot of factors on a canvas and there's no clear message. And to make it worse, Adam, if, you, if anybody is interested, go back and read that guidance. Go back and read footnote 10. They actually read one of the three Howey factors out of the Howey case, common enterprise. So not only do they confuse the law, but they try to rewrite the law. And then what are we supposed to make of uh, Bill Hinman, the former director of Cork Finn, his speech in 2018, where he said Ethereum that started out as a classic ICO, started out as a classic security capital raise, somehow morphed to a non-security because of it. Uh, the Ethereum network is now decentralized. You can't find the word decentralization in the 1946 Howey case involving Howard um, Orange Groves. And I'm not sure that um, uh, policymakers are really equipped to understand when a network is or is not uh, decentralized. So the problem for the SEC, and it's really the problem for any regulator for that matter, is you can't penalize a company and you can't penal penalize an individual where the regulator has not clearly communicated what their interpretation of the policy will be to the public. And that's what has happened here. And you can't see, simply keep repeating, as, as the SEC is now doing, and Gary Gensler is now doing, that uh, the law is clear when um, that's simply not true. Simply repeating that doesn't make it true. And Gary Gensler, and again, I don't mean to keep picking on him, it's sort of a euphemism for the SEC, but he's been out there very publicly, well, he's saying, well, um, the ones who are confused, it's not only market participants, but every sophisticated security lawyer in this country, they're confused because they are getting paid by the industry to be confused. Um, I think that's a really unfortunate statement. Quite frankly, I think it's an ugly statement. I wish it was one that he didn't repeat. But he, um, is Hester Peirce, is she a paid <laughs> show? Is Yvonne Boisman a paid shell? Is Brian Quintez, the former CFTC commissioner, a paid shell? The in, government officials are crying out for this lack of clarity. Members of Congress are crying out for this lack of clarity. And Gary Gensler, on the one side, is saying there's clarity, but then in the same breath, he's saying, but I need Congress to help me pass new laws to bring clarity to the space. So you can't have it both ways. But Stu, I guess one thing I'm I'm struggling with, and 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 you know, I I think maybe at least I, I read at least that part of of uh, uh, Gary Gensler's commentary a bit different, in the sense that I, I think this is an area where there is ambiguity, like with a, a lot of regulatory issues, and and I think for a lot of you know, I went to law school, you went to law school, I practiced and represented, I'm now in academia. It, when you have an ambiguous issue, you're often hired to represent one side and it doesn't mean you're wrong or you're a shill and so maybe that's fair to take uh, issue with that language but I guess if we step back for a minute you know I, I still and maybe we talked about a different example which I, I bring up given kind of what what you know you all being you know in, in active litigation on this so this this last month coinbase has been working on a, a new project or new product, Coinbase Lend. And, and it's been quite public that they've kind of tried to interact with, according to Coinbase, the SEC. And, and then the SEC has since filed a, a Wells notice, meaning the staff intends to recommend to the commission that the commission sue 
Coinbase and, and OpenCorp. And, and a couple of things there, you know, in my reading of the Coinbase Lend product, I, I think it is uncertain whether that product qualifies as a security based off of Howie and Reeves and, and other uh, uh, um, uh, other things. And, and so my advice, or if I was working with Coinbase, I'd say, listen, you are the most highest profile company in this space. I think there is some questions about this product. I could probably make an argument on both sides, but you are risking and, and being that you're the kind of highest profile enforcement target for the SEC, there is some risk. And so the kind of surprise and shock and saying, well, others are doing it. I just, for me, that's, you know, I, I just, as someone that's followed this, that's how the regulators have always acted in this country. They have limited resources. And then just further, I think what an issue is ambiguous, right? You get the opportunity to, I think, you know, argue that in court and, and resolve it there. Now, granted that's expensive, uh, and time consuming and, and certainly we'd all love to be in a place where there is more guidance but i guess my question in this and a lot of comments there is just i, I guess I, I don't know i mean should we have been better as the lawyers you know prior to even you joining uh, about guiding some of the, the the folks in this space about how regulatory bodies work in this country i guess i'm just i'm not surprised by any of this and and i think it's this is how things work here yeah, so uh, a couple of things, Adam. Number yeah. one, um, it is expensive and burdensome, and I think the SEC counts on the fact that it's going to be very really expensive and burdensome, and they count on people surrendering, and, yeah, and um, which is unfortunate. And But let's talk about the Coinbase thing for a minute. So I don't know enough about the Lend product to opine on it, but this is what I hear Coinbase complaining about. They say, the SEC says, come on in, uh, talk to us. The water's safe. So you go in and you talk to them. And then rather than having a convert, and I assume Coinbase hired the best lawyers to advise them on the Lend product and how to get it right. So you go in and have that conversation, you have your best securities lawyers with you. And rather than entering into a dialogue with the SEC about what, what the SEC may think you have wrong and how you can fix it, it turns into a secret inquisition. It turns into an investigation. I call it the creepy white panel ban approach to enforcement. Once you take the bait, you're in, you're trapped, and you can't get out. And that's regulation uh, by enforcement at its worst. And in the process, at the end of the day, the SEC says, we think you're on the wrong side of the law, but we're not going to tell you why. We're not going to tell you why your, your, your lawyers got it wrong. You need to fix it. And if you don't fix it, we're going to bring an enforcement action against you. A couple of things. Number one, who really gets hurt in that at the end of the day is I do think it's the investors or the retail holders or the consumers that are making, uh, who want to use these products in the U.S. because this uncertainty whipsaws them. Just look, go back to the moment what happened in the Ripple case when the SEC filed its complaint against Ripple in, on December 22nd um, of last year. $15 billion in XRP market cap was erased. Who was left holding the bag? The US retail holder of XRP that actually has no connection with Ripple. The court in the Ripple case just recently gave those retail platform to be heard, which I think is a good thing. Um, but Coinbase is now uh, withdrew their Lend product. But you know and I know, there are many others who are out there offering the Lend product and they, uh, so the product is out there, it's live, it's being offered, consumers are availing themselves to, 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 to it, but Coinbase, who did the right thing, who went in and engaged, somehow ended up on the wrong side of it, and they can't offer the product, whether the product needs to be conformed or doesn't need to be conformed. But the SEC in this process is picking winners and losers, which is unfortunate, and I think ultimately they're hurting the, the retail consumer at the end of the day. Thanks, Stu. I, I think just to, to my, again, understanding, and, and I think at this point, we, we really just kind of have what Coinbase has, has shared. So I, I don't know if we know the kind of full detail of their engagement. Also, I think they they did open up a waiting list for, for the product. And I think maybe perhaps that constitutes an action by Coinbase, whether it constitutes the offer of a sale of, of a security. And that's what caused the SEC to, to 
kind of file the Wells notice. I, I, we don't know. Um, but I also, to your point about kind of picking winners and losers, again, maybe this is unfair, but that's always the approach the regulators have taken, right? It's not like they have the capacity to just go, I think, after every actor in the space. If they feel like this sort of lending problem is problematic, then again, Coinbase is probably the most likely enforcement target. So again, I, I don't know if that's fair. I think maybe it's efficient the way that our regulators are resourced in this country, but but I think that's just always how they've done it, going after what they seem to be the highest profile. And you know maybe that's just the burden of, of being Coinbase uh, and, and being as large and high profile as it is. I, I'm not sure. So maybe, that works, yeah, maybe that works. Maybe that works. Um, so again, coming from the banking world, maybe that works where a regulator's jurisdiction over an industry or over market participants is clearly defined yeah. Yeah. and uh, uh, sort of not in dispute. So in that case, if you know a bank ends up on the wrong side of an OCC or Federal Reserve regulation, uh, they'll bring a high-profile enforcement action, and then you have all of the regulators and supervisors that crawl into every bank, and they said, oh, did you see what they just did to Citibank or Bank of America or J.P. Morgan Chase? You need to come into line, so all the dominoes fall. Here, yeah. I don't think that works, because the jurisdiction of the SEC is unclear, and the SEC is trying to gain that jurisdiction through this regulation by enforcement approach, which I think fails. Yeah, fair, yeah, fair point. You know, to, to kind of connect with something you said earlier, and, and one of the concerns about kind of the regulatory, I don't know, overreach or ambiguity in the U.S. is that it creates arbitrage and that, that, you know, innovation moves offshore. But we talked about, I think the risk there is arguably it, it, things can go one of two directions. They can become more clear, as, as you pointed out, in, in jurisdictions like Singapore. They can also become more clear in a different direction. Uh, a la China. And, and so I guess, can you speak to kind of that landscape and, and how you navigate that? Sure. Well, um, I think we are, well, Ripple, we believe, is one of the adults in the room in this um, in this space. So before we launch in the country, we really want to make sure that we're respecting the laws and the licensing framework. And, and we are navigating and our customers are navigating to those jurisdictions where uh, there is that clear licensing framework. I think you see it, um, and there are some jurisdictions that are just outright hostile uh, to crypto and say, you know, uh, don't do business here and we'll avoid those. Um, uh, China, you know, uh, has just announced, you know, recently announced their their ban. I guess they, they announce a ban on crypto about every six months, but they just announced their latest ban. I do think there is some, you know, um, the coincidence of timing on that one with the launch of the digital one is interesting because I think they want to displace uh, unregulated crypto with state regulated uh, digital money uh, so they can maximize their surveillance opportunity. Uh, but I, I, I guess, and I don't know if I'm touching on your question, but I, I guess what we're navigating, we, we, we embrace regulation. This is not about not having regulation. This is not about not having investor protection. This is not about not protecting the integrity of the markets. And in most other countries where we're doing business, we are able to get there. Uh, we're able to understand it. Um, uh, and in the US, we continue we continue to have the struggle. And I do think, and I know some folks believe it, some folks don't believe it, but I think innovation in the in this space is leaving the US. Um, and I know that just from my job day in and day out. I know where my customers are headed or where Ripple's customers are headed. Uh, and I know from just talking to some of my contemporaries in this space. Um, and if you don't believe, not you, but the euphemism, if you don't believe that, then I think you have to believe that at least the innovation is being stifled. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, we're not allowing this innovation to reach its full potential. Think about, as you know, what happened in 1996 in this country with the, um, the nascent industry of the internet. Nobody knew really what it was, how it was gonna be used, whether it was gonna be used for good or whether it was gonna be used for bad. But at least the administration in 1996 knew that we shouldn't regulate the internet with laws that were designed for uh, transistor radios and rotary telephones, right? They knew that we needed a different framework, a more flexible framework, 
And that's what's missing now in this space in the US. I think this is akin to the industrial revolution. This is a techno uh, technological revolution. And I think the SEC, is, uh, um, uh, the SEC in the US uh, is really causing the US to miss out uh, yeah. on this revolution. I guess, and, and I mentioned to this too yesterday, as, as someone you know, that has seen, you know, uh, we consider you know, blockchain as a technology. I think the pace of innovation in this country globally has 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 you know, rivaled any other tech I, I've seen. And, and I guess maybe I might argue that that some stifling, some some uh, uh, requirement that the technology bring in folks like you, right? I think if this was an easy question, if the U.S. just opened the door to things, or if the U.S. just closed the door, uh, like China, we wouldn't have folks like you coming into to companies like Ripple. So I, I'm not sure. I, I think for me, the jury is still out on, on whether, how, to what degree the, the U.S. regulatory system, which again, I think is operating as it always has, um, is, is, is stifling Crypto and, and sure, I think on the margins there there are probably some issues, but I, for me, I, I think that the jury is still out. Um, Stu, I, I want to just transition a, a bit to kind of advice you might have for kind of new innovators in this space or, or the community at large, given the the kind of challenges of of uh, you know kind of pushing this to its limit, the cost of of litigation. Etc. Like, what can folks do? Should they be lobbying Congress to set clearer boundaries? Um, you know, to your point, it, maybe it sounds like engaging with the SEC isn't a good idea. Although maybe the the, the takeaway there is you should never talk to the cops, um, even if they're asking you to. Uh, but ultimately, what what do you think, Stu? How can we kind of help this industry, given the 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 landscape as it is, and probably won't change. How can folks move forward? Um, so, you know, a couple of things, and I think you've hit upon them. I, I think, um, uh, number one, uh, explore your options and opportunities. I think there are far more welcoming jurisdictions where you can kind of plant your flag and get started within a regulatory framework. Um, think about that as to where, where you're going to start. Uh, and then secondly, I do think that um, continue to engage with policymakers and thought leaders in the United States. I think the conversation, the, the, the policy conversation around crypto has absolutely exploded in the past 12 or 13 months. And in fact, I think it may be because, um, uh, because of how vocal Gary Gensler's been. And I think there were some, some you know, cautiously optimistic folks coming from MIT, understanding technology, maybe he would work more collaboratively with, um, uh, with the industry. It's clear that, uh, at least to me and I think to others, that he has declared all out war on this space. And I think that has woken up many policymakers that are saying not so fast. So I do think there's an opportunity. And I, I think what you will find if you engage with policymakers is a real open door. Um, and the first part of that conversation is education. Yep. Right. We, we, you, and I are starting this conversation at an edu, you know, uh, you know, at an edu, whatever, you know, freshman in high school, sophomore in college, you know, graduate class. When you're going in and talking to policymakers, you need to kind of bring it back down to, you know, a little yep. bit of uh, crypto one on one. But they do want to be educated, and they do want to. I, I think many do want to get to a right place. Yeah. Um, so engagement uh, engagement is is absolutely key. A couple of great questions, Stu. Um, first one asks, kind of makes the point about U.S. policymakers becoming, I guess, more aware of crypto. There's a, a they highlight the um, Senator Loomis's purchase disclosure. Think of, of Bitcoin, and I think we're seeing this across the board. It is becoming mainstream. I, I think yesterday I saw a tweet from the actress Reese, Reese Witherspoon about NFTs, and so how, how do you think kind of this increased awareness, maybe the movement mainstream of of crypto, crypto assets, blockchain uh, use cases will impact? I think it leads to your point about maybe making it easier to have conversations and and to open up to to allow. Uh, policymakers to set clearer boundaries. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe to state the painfully obvious is that the industry can no longer be ignored. 
Yeah. I think when Jay Clayton first took office in 2017, the entire market cap of crypto was about 150 million. Now it's two trillion. Um, so uh, the innovation and the you know uh, it, it, it's here, it's growing, uh, it's not going to go away. It needs to be uh, dealt with in a rational way. So I do think even when I joined you know the industry in January 2019, coming up on three years now. I think the conversations that I'm able to have now compared to the conversations in the U.S. that I was able to have nearly three years ago, very, very different. I think policymakers are leaning in. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't pick up, you know, whether it's the virtual or the paper, you know, the physical paper, uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle. You can't watch Bloomberg without having uh, two or three crypto articles every single day. So I think policymakers have woken up to the fact that this is a really important topic uh, that needs to be dealt with in a way that's rational. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a rational regulatory framework because a rational regulatory framework leads to predictable results. And I think what we have now is a very irrational framework that's leading to very unpredictable results. And, and Stu, another question, and, and I guess, what do you think the, the prospects are given this increased awareness around policymakers for actually, you know, legislation to be passed in the U.S.? Someone points to kind of the, the more bureaucratic EU proposing a reform package a year ago and the, the U.S. being slow to that. I think you're kind of this, maybe if the first step is awareness, the second step is just getting anything through this Congress. So, so what do you think the kind of the, the, the outlook is? Yeah, I mean, um, I, that's a tough one, Adam. I, I mean, I think uh, actually getting you know uh, legislation to the point where it's passed by both houses and signed, that's a long haul, no matter what the topic. Um, uh, crypto is a priority, and uh, obviously it's not the number one priority for Congress. But if we go back to where we started in terms of you know regulation 101 and what Congress's oversight responsibility is, I do think having these hearings, having these conversations, having these roundtables, having these uh, education sessions, whether or not it actually leads to a piece of legislation that passes for, um, uh, you know, uh, as law, which I, I, I think there's a reasonable probability that that could happen. I think the conversation and the, the policy, the pressure that's brought um, by policymakers onto the process hopefully it can lead to a rational regulatory outcome, even short of the passage of a law. Although I think the passage of law is still very much on the table. Yeah. Because it's needed. It's absolutely yeah. needed. Yeah, I, I agree. All, um, roads don't lead to this, all roads don't lead to the SEC on this one. Yeah, well, yeah, and I agree. And I think, again, this goes back to when there isn't that clarity from Congress, it does leave a, a void that, you know, the, the, regulated, the regu regulatory industries are, are apt often to, to step up and, and fill. Um, so it, it, it will be interesting. I, I've got a couple more questions, but I, again, I want to encourage folks, if there are questions, to, to please send those in. And, and we, we have a bit more time with Stu here. Um, Stu, another question for you. I, I think, you know, the, the regulatory bodies, members of Congress often talk about kind of consumer protection. and, and as you mentioned, you know, adoption of, of crypto related products, services are, are, you know, have increased. I mentioned Reese Witherspoon, NFTs, et cetera. I, I still think there is this view of, of this space being largely Silicon Valley and, and not Main Street. And, and can you talk about that tension and kind of how you're seeing adoption change and how that may might influence the, the this conversation? Um. Well, I, I, I think about, you know, again, going back to three years ago, which is where, you know, my entry point of the folks who've been in this space, you know, for eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years. But three years ago, I think, you know, even though, again, you know, um, I managed my whole career in New York, when I, when I would travel the hill, I think I was viewed as a Silicon Valley exec, and why are you, what are you in here talking to us about? Right. I don't think I get that now. I, I think I get a very different reception now, and I think there, again, there is a recognition that this is just not a kind of a niche or a weird innovation born, you know, born of Silicon Valley. That there is a there there. Uh, it, it number one, it can't be ignored just because of, of its market cap. 
Number two, there's a lot of retail uh, uh, consumers that are very interested in this space. And then, you know, maybe just as importantly, there's a lot of institutional players here that are now leading into the space. So you combine all of those three things together, I think it, you have a, a much more welcome conversation. Great. Well, Stu, my, my last question for you is, is you know, I, I, so you're, you're one kind of, Ripple is one actor within a, a very diverse and dynamic space. And, and I think even though now there's, there's a, a lobbying association that represents the crypto industry, but, but given your time here, your experience, if you had the kind of a magic wand and if you could change one thing or give some advice to the industry about how it kind of moves forward, what would that be? Um, well, I, I would give, uh, give advice more probably to the policymakers and the regulators and the industry. You've given uh, plenty. You've got to say, you're in charge. What direction are you taking things with the industry? What do you think the industry needs to focus on, do better, continue? Um, where, where do you want the industry to go? Well, I, uh, I would like the where the industry is going, I'd like them to continue to go, is to recognize that uh, getting to a rational regulatory framework is a two-way street, uh, that we've got to hold ourselves out as responsible actors. Um, we have to self-police ourselves. We have to protect our customers and our consumers, uh, depending on your platform. Um, and, uh, you know, educate yourself in terms of what the laws, rules, and regulations are, and where the gaps are, and that's not to say that you don't avoid the gaps, but you you try to put, you know you, I think everyone is trying to operate on the right side of the law. Gets back to my theme of this conversation, Adam, is um, if you've got this isn't a bunch of like just you know twenty something Silicon Valley, let's move fast and break things. I mean, you've got the best security lawyers in the country leaning in, trying to get to the right solution here. And uh, so I think the um, the industry continue to lean in, continue to be respectful, continue to open up, continue to educate, 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 but the policymakers and the regulators have to come and meet us at least halfway. Well, Stu, I, I want to thank you for beating me halfway. I, I know, you know, lawyers are known for working hard. We aren't always known for making ourselves available in public forums like this. And I had said from the very beginning, you know, by agreeing to do this, that that you would have to kind of meet me halfway and allow me to ask some tough questions, which you you have. And so I, I thank you for that. And again, glad that that the industry now has folks like you uh, uh, helping to lead it. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone at the conference for uh, your participation, your great questions. Uh, please come visit us on the Berkeley campus. We're doing a lot of great things in this space. Great, Adam. I hope to meet you in person soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Stu. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Don't forget to like and subscribe.